Welcome. You are listening to the preaching of God's Word at the United Baptist Church of Ellsworth, Maine. Thank you for listening, and we hope you hear what the Lord has for you today. Well, I had thought about doing something at the beginning of service, beginning of this sermon, um, that I thought might have been a little cruel. Um, (laughs) I thought about seeing who's been here and for how long. The whole raise your hand, and put it down, and put it down, and put it down. And uh, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) But my reasoning behind that thinking was that we're looking at our vision as a church. And as we look at our vision, our vision is not just something to look ahead to, but to look back upon who we are, who we've been, and see how the Lord's bringing us along. I know that as I look at our vision to be a praying, growing church that glorifies God and meets the physical and spiritual needs of our members, Ellsworth, Hancock County, and beyond, that I can state with confidence This vision is not just some far-off goal we hope to reach, but it's who we are now in many ways. We can look around and see how we are living into what we aspire to. And we can look back and see how God has brought us along as a body of believers. It's easy to miss the Lord's work in his church if you don't step back every once in a while. If you haven't been there through the ups and downs, You need to dig a little and find out what's been going on in the church. We here might think of the many people who have joined this body, bringing their gifts and their passions to the work. We could reflect on the transitions we've made over the years, whether it be how we organize our ministry efforts, changes to the Sunday worship service, or new ministries begun and stewarded throughout the years. And we can certainly thank God once again for the provision we had no right to expect that has allowed us to follow boldly where the Lord has led. Now, a lot of the changes over the last years have been technical in nature. Changing building is a pretty earthly technical change. But behind all of them, and more important than any of them, are the spiritual works that God has effected in us. Pastor Scott's already spoken in this series about change and our resistance to it. If you've been around churches for very long, I think I can say with confidence that you either know someone who has resisted change in the church, or you've been that person yourself. And again, echoing Scott, change for change's sake is not a good thing. I hope, however, that even a visitor who took the time to hear of the changes we've made over time could see in them the Lord growing us to better fulfill our mission and realize our vision here at United Baptist. I hope it's plain that the outward changes flow from the inward work, the inward growth in our congregation. This morning we're going to be reflecting on our goal of being a church that meets spiritual needs. And as we do so, I hope we will keep in mind how the Lord has already met so many spiritual needs among us and how his work is what fuels our work to meet the needs of those around us. God, you are are good, and your word is great. Pray that it will speak loudly today, and we will have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps, as we read our scripture verse, you realize that this is not the first time in this series we've been in Colossians chapter 1. Two weeks ago, when we were looking at being a growing church, our scripture was verses 1 through 6 of this chapter. And today, a goodly portion of our focus will be on the 28th verse of Colossians 1, but you'll see that there's a lot in this chapter that relates to our topic today of meeting spiritual needs. Before we dive into the text, though, let's take some time to clarify what we mean when we're talking about spiritual needs. Spiritual needs, simply put, are those needs that we have which nothing earthly can meet. And you'll find there are many in this world who deny we have any spiritual needs. Along with many who say that the answers to our spiritual needs are less mundane needs, are more esoteric or ethereal needs. We can answer those needs ourselves. 
that mindfulness or self-actualization or self-love and self-esteem will meet whatever pesky little needs we have that science or money or government can't fulfill. The truth is that there are some needs we humans have that cannot truly be met without looking to something beyond the physical or even beyond ourselves and our minds. What are these needs? First, there's the need for answers to the big questions of life. Where do we come from? Does the universe, and specifically humanity, have a purpose? Is there right and wrong? What happens when we die? The search for the answers to these questions has shaped the course of history, and sometimes taken humanity in horrifying directions. Every man-made philosophy falls short of satisfying the hunger we have for the big picture. And ultimately, we end up cheapening life and mankind. We end up with worldviews that permit much, but offer little in the way of objective truth. Peace for our souls. The answers to the big questions are the framework for our lives, and they cannot be properly answered without reference to the spiritual. Our second need is the need for power to face life. This might not always seem like a spiritual need when you see it in practice. There are many people who are confident, easygoing, or ambitious, who handle pretty well all that life throws at them. There are even more who see life as bouncing from one catastrophe to the next. And of course, if life is meaningless, then it doesn't really matter how we act or live. But almost no one actually lives like life is meaningless. Most everyone wants to live life well, to react well to situations, to be strong, to live wisely. We want there to be some measure for success in life, and we want to attain to it. Well, what if there are objective answers to the big questions? From those answers might be derived a right and wrong way to live. If there is an objective standard for men's lives, then life becomes a lot harder because we don't get to make the rules and change them at our whim. If there are objective standards, it might not be enough to be a successful businessman. You might have to be a good father, too. Going along to get along sounds good, but what if it's not right? Of course, pain and suffering are not to be taken lightly, shouldn't be taken lightly. But growing bitter or giving up hope might be the wrong response. We need power to live rightly. And we need that power both in the moment, in all the moments, and for the long term. This is the third spiritual need we have, very closely related. Some might call it transcendence. We recognize in ourselves the desire to be more than we are. Not just to do better, but to be better. Some strive hard to grow and change. Some shrug their shoulders at what appears unattainable. But I think you'll find that those who argue they don't need to be better generally fall into two categories. They're either completely blinded by pride to their own failings, or they are terrified of their own weaknesses and doubts about themselves. If we're being honest, we all have areas where we could improve where we could be better. You'll note that up to now, I've tried to avoid using Bible talk in exploring what spiritual needs are. This is intentional. If we're going to be in the business of meeting these needs, it's important that we remember that it is common for people to address the needs of life unbiblically. Even Christians can try to frame their problems and formulate solutions without reference to the Word of God. Last week, we learned that to be a church that glorifies God is to be a church whose members love and believe in the Word of God. The natural outflow of this is to be a church that responds to the problems of life by pointing to the Word of God, pointing ourselves, pointing others, bringing those problems to Scripture and seeing what Scripture has to say about it. And Scripture does have something to say about it about our spiritual needs. Scripture makes plain that though people's needs often seem very diverse and confused, we only have one great spiritual need. 
Our separation from God through the wickedness of sin is the true problem. And it is from that that all other spiritual needs are born. If separation then is the problem, the solution to our spiritual needs is reconciliation with God. It's the solution you'd expect sitting here in a gospel preaching church. It's the answer we give to our own or other people's problems. It's the answer that jumps to mind for many. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, coming again. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Him we proclaim. Not it. Not true statements about life. Not good ideas or maxims or wisdom passed down through the ages. We proclaim Jesus. We proclaim him because our faith is in him, just as the faith of the Colossians was in Christ, for which Paul thanked God in verse 4 of our text. Whatever the apparent need is, we bring the person to Jesus and let the testimony of the gospel speak to that need. Now, this is not a bait and switch. We're not asking people to set aside their lesser needs and ignore their feelings for a minute while they consider Jesus. Jesus truly is the answer. The gospel is the story of how God worked to fulfill our great spiritual need. And it explains all the others. From it flows his grace to cover all of life's troubles and trials. And we see it right here in Colossians 1. Look at verses 15 through 20 again with me. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. By him all things were created. This is the answer to the big question of where we came from. And look at how the text speaks of Jesus' place, the image of the invisible the firstborn, before all things, the head, the beginning, preeminent. In him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. If this is Christ's position, then what does that say about his teaching and his commands? They're co-equal with God's. They define human morality. Another of the big questions. What about our purpose? Verse 16, all things were created through him and for him. If Christ is the reconciler, then our proper purpose is to be the reconciled, brought into the body under his headship, brought back into communion with God. What about the question of creation's destiny? Note that in verse 20, Jesus is reconciling all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Now move with me down to verse 21. And you who once were alienated, and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Our destiny, to be presented holy and blameless and above reproach if we continue in the faith. This, of course, means by implication that those who do not continue will be presented and found unholy, blemished and disgraced, and worthy of reproach. Reconciliation to God through Christ is the deciding factor for our destiny. All right, you say. The answers to the big questions are all well and good, but what about real life? How is Jesus the solution to the problems of life? How does he give us power for life? Well, I know there are many in this congregation who don't need me to answer that for them. And for that, I praise the Lord. There aren't enough hours in the day 
for the testimonies of this body to God's power in our lives. He is so good to us. But let's see again what Paul has to say to the Colossians, moving back up to verse 9. Paul writes, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. Don't you hope someone prays all that for you? Wow. But what caused Paul to pray for this? hearing about the Colossians' faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is the prerequisite to the power of God for life. That doesn't mean that we are checking a box and becoming worthy and deserving of God's power. Rather, we are learning to depend on God and finding, as Peter puts it, that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We can have patience even if it's not natural to us. We can be bold, even if we're naturally timid. We can suffer well, strengthened by the strength of our mighty God. These verses also speak to our need for transcendence, or as we call it in Christian circles, sanctification. Becoming holy, becoming those who are set apart and who image Christ. Paul's prayer here is not just a prayer for power, but a prayer for the Colossians' sanctification. That through all the moments of relying on God's power, their knowledge of, their experience of God would increase. That as Paul wrote to the Romans, they would be transformed by the renewal of their minds. That by testing, by living it out over time, they would discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. That's how it is. We live it out and we see that God's way is good and acceptable and perfect. And our hearts are transformed. We go from wanting to do the right thing to loving to do the right thing. We go from struggling not to do the wrong thing to hating sin. That's the progression of growth as a believer. And we'll return to this thought in a bit of God transforming us us discerning his will, being transformed. But let's take some time now in verse 28 of this morning's passage and see how United Baptist meets spiritual needs. How we speak to the big questions. How we speak to the problems of life. How we speak to the need to change. Because if God's word is true, we do need to change. We need to become what we are not. Verse 28 begins, Him we proclaim. To proclaim is to declare, to make known. The foremost method in how we proclaim Christ is that we preach the gospel from this pulpit. Whether we're in Mark or Obadiah, Jesus is the interpreting lens of our text. He is the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, as Paul writes in verse 26. Sometimes that gospel, that good news, is joyous. And sometimes it's hard. The gospel is not fun when it challenges our sinful hearts or makes plain our weakness and how often we fail to rely on God's strength. But it is still good news. And this church is faithful to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Beyond the pulpit... We encourage and equip our members to proclaim Jesus to each other and to the world. One of the refrains in our groups and studies over the years has been gospel application. We ask how the gospel shapes our understanding of a text or of a topic so that we can all learn to speak to life in gospel terms. So we can see how our needs relate to our need, our need for Christ. And we can understand how he is the answer, the one to go to with all of our needs. Many of our studies have to do with the issues of life that we face today. 
And our groups are designed for long-term growth around the Word of God, continually taking it in, knowing it, understanding who Christ is by his revelation to us. Our counseling ministry and the various groups and studies related to it are also important ways that we proclaim Christ. Those who seek to be a part of them are going to hear the gospel, either as believers who will hear it applied to their life circumstances or as unbelievers who are offered Christ as the first and most crucial step in dealing with whatever they are going through. What it comes down to is that there is one message in this church. We are united not because we all agree on everything, but we all agree on the one thing. This church belongs to Jesus, and his gospel is our profession to each other and to the world. Looking back to verse 28, we not only proclaim, but we warn. This word could also mean to caution or to reprove gently. One of our foundations classes, those classes that we teach periodically, usually during the Sunday school hour, and that we hope all of our members can take part in at some point, is the peacemaking church. We learn in this class that our great need for reconciliation with God also produces the need for reconciliation with each other. In peacemakers, as we often call it, we look at how God's word and the message of the gospel shows us how to respond to conflict and how to glorify God in the midst of conflict. And a big part of this is learning how to restore those in sin. Because the majority of conflicts have some element of sin in them. How to reprove gently and help a brother or sister with the speck in their eye after checking to make sure we don't have a log in our own. And yes, for many, this is the uncomfortable part of body life, especially up here in the Northeast where everyone likes their elbow room and for everyone to stay out of their business. But as a gospel-believing church, we are acknowledging that we sin, that we don't always get it right, and that we need correction. And the scripture is clear. It is the job of the church to correct its members when they are off track. Paul makes this plain. Both here in this text and in Galatians 1, where he says, If anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You who are spiritual means those who have the Holy Spirit. Those who walk by the Spirit. Those who are led by and have access to the wisdom of the Spirit. That's a bit of a broad understanding, isn't it? If you are in Christ, your obligation is to help your brothers and sisters. If one member suffers, we all suffer. We are one body. And we understand that right after this, Paul spends several verses warning his readers about their own weakness and the tendency to become prideful, which is a huge temptation we are no when we are noticing another's sin. It's not easy. Warning or correcting others is clearly difficult, but it is what we ought to do if we are to represent Christ properly to each other and to the world, if we are to meet each other's spiritual needs. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, Paul states that those who bear the gospel have been given the ministry of reconciliation and goes on to clarify that though it is God who reconciles, we carry the message of reconciliation. What a privilege to carry that message, even if parts of it are uncomfortable. May we be, may our counselors, our men and women in groups and studies, our informal gatherings, may they be full of godly reproof, offered gently and in love for the purpose of reconciling us to God and each other. We're not going around being the thought police. We're going around loving each other enough to speak when that's necessary. We proclaim, we warn, and we teach. Not only that, but we teach with all wisdom. This means that our teaching is not just word studies and factoids. We're relying on God's Spirit to be the true and ultimate teacher, to bring the Word of God to life so that it might speak to our needs. And how often does it do that? How often do we go in and get blindsided by the perfect verse for where we're at? 
the perfect message on a Sunday morning, the perfect message from a brother or sister. God's word being lived out, being spoken supernaturally into our lives. That is speaking the truth with all wisdom, with a reliance on the Spirit. We rely on God's Spirit to bring the Word of God to life so that it might speak to our needs. And we seek as a church to pass on knowledge and form proper doctrine, but we do so with an understanding that it is God who speaks to hearts, not our study and training and eloquence. We do study. We do work to know and to show what the Bible says about life. We train each other for godliness and prepare ourselves to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ. We ensure that our teachers are qualified. But we also let the Lord lead us at times to put aside the prepared material and minister instead to a need expressed in the moment. We build relationships in which we can speak the truth of God into each other's lives and have it received as an expression of love. And we teach as those who are not God, those who acknowledge their own frailties and failings. Well, what do we hope to see from all this? Is there a metric for meeting spiritual needs? Yes, there is. That we may present everyone mature in Christ. Let's unpack this. Everyone. That sounds pretty broad, wouldn't you say? We warn everyone and teach everyone so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Does Paul really mean everyone? Yes and no. Remember that this verse is the culmination of a whole series of statements about or aimed directly at a group of believers. Paul is not denying the task of proclaiming to and warning the world. It's his primary vocation. But he is speaking here of these actions within the body. In this light, Paul means everyone with whom he has influence as a brother, or as he sometimes expresses it, a father in the faith. Even this church in Colossae that he's never visited. He wants to encourage them. He wants to build them up. And so he tells them what body life is to look like. Proclaiming, warning, teaching, so that all who hear, all who, who receive, are brought to maturity. For us, today, this teaching mainly means those who are committed to those bo this body, those with whom we have influence, those who can receive a warning or a teaching and take it in by the power of the Spirit. This is by no means an invitation to focus inward. The message of the gospel is explicit in turning us outward and, in fact, sending us out. Go! Go, Jesus said. You'll see in our vision statement that we desire to meet not only the spiritual needs of our church members, but of the people of Ellsworth, Hancock County, and beyond. And we are intentional in doing this in our missions, in our outreach, in our care for those who can't make it in the door or who don't know the door even exists, our neighbors, our co-workers. We are obligated to bring him to them. But the meeting of spiritual needs, like charity, starts at home. We look to meet the spiritual needs within our body so that we might be brought to maturity. And to send the ill-equipped, those still unlearning the world, is failing to teach with all wisdom. It doesn't mean that young Christians can't minister, but it means that we help bring them along, that we don't give them meat before they're ready. We have only to look at the Corinthian church to see the dangers of immaturity. The foolishness of the Corinthians was damaging their witness and opposing the work of the gospel, both within the body and in their city. So to bring the body to maturity is to bring them to that place where they're no longer in the introductory, where they can handle spiritual meat, the, the fullness of the word of God and his complete lordship over their lives, which is what Paul desired of the people in Corinth. To present everyone mature is to ensure that they are not carried about by every wind of doctrine, as Ephesians says, that they avoid foolish controversies, that they are quick to listen, 
slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It is ultimately as Paul prayed for the Colossians to be stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. It's not about meeting a set of requirements, studying Hebrew or Greek. It's not about having so many years under your belt. It's about being sure that you know the gospel and hold to it in your life and can explain it to someone else. And of course, all this is done in Christ. In a very real sense, spiritual maturity for the Christian is a matter of proximity. It is closeness with Christ. This is why Paul explains maturity to the Ephesians by saying that we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the fruit of the work of the church, the work of the gospel. It's people who are close to Jesus. A church body that actively seeks to present everyone mature in Christ will develop Christians who are close to Christ, who imitate Christ. We return here to Romans 12, to Paul exhorting his readers to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. As the Lord leads and brings a body of believers along, as he impresses upon them the beauty of the gospel, that body clears the way for the gospel to increase among them and to be proclaimed by them to the world. They encourage the passions and gifts of their members. They surrender collectively to the Lord's leading and walk boldly toward where their king sends them. This is where we started this morning, thinking about what God has done among us, what God is doing in us, how he's bringing us along. It's where we'll close, giving praise to God for bringing us along, for meeting our spiritual needs and equipping us to meet the spiritual needs of others. Take a moment to reflect. What spiritual needs of yours has the Lord met? How has he brought you individually along? And how might he meet your needs today? Maybe he's brought you this morning to where you can admit for the first time that you need his salvation, that nothing else can satisfy the longings of your heart besides reconciliation with God. Maybe you're realizing today that you've been trying to meet some of your needs elsewhere instead of going to the one who invites you to cast your cares upon him. Maybe you need eyes to see the needs of others, a heart softened and a mind alert to be ready to minister reconciliation. Would you take a moment to pray to the Lord? If you thirst, He can satisfy. When you are weak, He is strong. If you fear, He is your shield, your refuge, your safe place. And if you are lost, He can find you and bring to your life the healing power of the cross. Take a moment, lift your praise and your needs to the Lord. Thanks for listening. If you have questions about what you heard in today's sermon, please contact us via email at ubc at ubcellsworth.org or through Facebook Messenger at facebook.com slash ubcellsworth. Our worship service begins at 10.30 on Sunday morning. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.